Stephen Andrews with Sorex Consulting is here with me today, and there's some unique inter- information here. So I want you to head over to Sorex Consulting and look for that giveaway button because Andrew and his team are giving away an obscene amount of money to get people started in real estate investing. I think some of those the, the pool is up in that $500,000 range. So definitely worth your time to head over there. And while you're there, check out his new book. It's called The New American Dream, A Simple Roadmap to Purchasing Investment Properties. We're going to divide into, dive into some of that information as well. So Sorax Consulting, that'll be a clickable link in the show notes. Really appreciate your time, Andrew. Absolutely. So glad to be here. So I'm always curious. We're going to start things off, and I'm going to, I'm going to limit you on this, truncate your how you found your way into real estate investing to begin with. There's always an origin story. Where, where Absolutely. did you find your way? Yeah, so uh, my senior year at High Point University, I took a real estate class my senior year, and my professor was an adjunct professor from Chicago, and he owned investment properties in Chicago and apartment complexes, and he was wanting to expand down into North Carolina, and so he took this professor role as well to kind of, I guess, to be able to give back and to, to stay involved and and I just fell in love with it. You know, I grew up in an entrepreneur family. My parents owned a landscaping business. So I knew I wanted to do something business related, but just didn't necessarily know what. But during that class, uh, we did a simulation, a virtual simulation where you had to simulate buying an apartment complex, make it profitable the first year. And I just fell in love with real estate. And so I have to credit that class at, in my time at Huffington University with, with so much of my desire to get into real estate. Yeah, that's a unique experience. I haven't heard anybody having something like that in a course before. Absolutely. You know, it's, it was, it was really cool. A lot of pressure, you know, obviously it's a simulation, but if you made it profitable in the first year, you got a good grade. If you didn't, you didn't get a good grade. And so, you know, it, it kind of even puts you in the hot seat to make make the right decision. And the cool thing is High Point still to this day does the exact same class. And so I actually was back on campus uh, back this spring speaking with the real estate club and kids still love that class because it gives them real life experience without using real money. And so it's just so cool to be a part of that. Mm -hmm. So coming right out of college, how did you find the money or where did you start when it came to the real estate investing Right. So when I graduated uh, from High Point University, I was $75,000 in debt, predominantly that was student loan debt. But I did make a great wise investment as a 22-year-old and, and bought a brand new car. That, that was a great investment at the time, right? So, And I was making $45,000 a year of being a retail store manager. So I didn't have a lot of money left over at the end of the day. I was scared, which most people are when you try something new. And it took me a couple of years to pull the trigger. And I still remember I was telling my uh, parents about wanting to get into real estate. And my dad told me, he said, well, hey, you know, I know a guy that's been in real estate 25, 30 years. Don't know if he can help you, but hey, here's his name. Here's his number. Give him a call. And, and that was the best call I ever made. His name's Joel. He lives here in central North Carolina, the Piedmont Triad. And he was looking at downsizing his real estate company. He wanted to spend more time with his family. And I wanted to get into it. And so it was just a match made in heaven. And, and he gave me so much insight over the years of experience they had. And uh, he told me to re- read a book called Building Wealth by Russell Whitney. And the book was, was originally written in the 90s and then re- re- republished in the 2000s. And it just gave so many great strategies on how you can really grow a, a real estate business. A lot of people call that the first strategy where you, where you buy horse house on the block, put some sweat equity in it, refinance and pull your money back out and roll it to the next property. And that's exactly what I've done. But I didn't have any money, you know. So there again, to reiterate, I was $75,000 in debt, $45,000 a year making an income. And I was telling Joel, I said, Joel, you know, I don't have a lot of money left over the end of the day. And he said, you know, that's okay. He said, we got to get creative. And he said, is there any way that you can get your hands on anything? And I said, well, you know, I did have a credit card that would allow a cash advance off the credit card. And I said, you know, I could do that because I'm, I'm okay with taking a chance on myself. And so that's exactly what I did. 
you know, uh, had a credit card there at the time was only 7% interest if you took money off of it. That same credit card to this day is in the, in the 20%, 20, 30%. And so much different landscape. But a lot of people even then said, hey, 7% interest is really high because then it was. You know, now everybody would take a 7% interest rate and uh, with, with the way the market is today. But but I, I took a chance on myself and I pulled enough money off that card for the down payment, which at the time was only 15%. A lot of that's changed now, right? And now it's more 20, 25, 30% you have to have now. He linked me up with a banker that, that would local hometown bank. I was talking to the president of the bank. And so he was fine with taking a chance on me because Joel vouched for me. And so it was more of a, a handshake deal on this. And so that was my down payment, taking money off, put the down payment down. I bought the worst house on the block and then I fixed it up. And now I'm refinancing and I also pulled money off the credit card for the fix up cost because there again, I didn't have any money. And then I refinanced it and paid my credit card back off and I was able to roll that money into the next deal. And so I tell people I got in this business with none of my own money, right? Because I didn't have any money. I, I took out of a checking account or savings account to do that. I had to borrow that money. And uh, that strategy can still work to this day. You know, certainly you got to be a little bit more creative today than what you did back then, but it's certainly an option. Well, going through that experience, would you advise somebody to me, go as far as taking a cre- cre- taking out credit cards and trying to buy their first property? You know, I think it, it depends, right? You know, so I think it depends on your situation. I certainly would have never had that confidence to do that if I didn't have people around me that knew real estate, right? You know, I would have never done that and, and not having a mentor that, that said, hey, if you do X, Y, and Z, you can be successful. And so I think you have to be cautious and be careful. Certainly today, credit cards are in the 20, 30% range. I don't know if I'd go credit card route now, but there's creative financing ways that you can do that work very similar to my credit card story of, of 10 years ago. But I think you have to do the research and put yourself in a position to win. And so I was betting on myself because I knew that I had done everything that I was supposed to do to set myself up to be successful. You know, I read the book that Joel wanted me to read. I surrounded myself with someone that that had done this before and that he was guiding me. And so he wasn't going to let me get off into right field or left field. He was going to keep me on the straight and narrow and on the train tracks. And so I think when you surround yourself with people like that, I think you can do stuff. I think you can take maybe a little bit of a risk because it's more of a calculated risk, right? You know, you're not only betting on yourself, but you're also surrounding yourself to be successful. And I'll say this, that most people that are successful in this country, sometimes you get, every single one of them probably took a risk at some point to get to where they're at. You brought up your mentor a couple times here now. Talk a little bit about how that propelled you forward. And if somebody was looking for a mentor in their life, what they should do and maybe how would they approach somebody for that type of purpose? Absolutely. You know, I think a mentor, whether you're in real estate, whether you're in a a completely different field, I think mentors are so beneficial because those are the ones that have been there before you. Those are the ones that have the success stories, but also have the failures, right? And I don't believe in, you know, a failure is only a failure if you don't learn from it, if you don't, you know, get through it. But you know, some of the greatest blessings in life is when you don't succeed, you know, and, and so some of the greatest lessons that I have is when I struggled and uh, it's made me who I am today. And so having a mentor like Joel, he's able to say, all right, you know, in certain situations, you know, when I first bought the property, well, hey, Joel, I bought the worst house on the block. I want to put some money into it. And this is what I want to do. And guess what? He did the exact same thing that I did, but he did it 25 years earlier. And so now he's being able to, well, hey, Stephen, this is what took place for me. Certainly a different market now, certainly, you know, years later. But the principles of real estate are really the same. You know, they never change, right? Now, how you might do business or how you get financing, that stuff changes. It evolves over time. But having a mentor is so valuable. You know, I tell people some of the best mentors are the ones that you least expect. You know, so Joel's not a flashy person. You know, he's just an everyday guy that had, that had quite a bit of success, but he doesn't think he's better than anybody else. And so 
He's very down to earth. For me, mentors, you want somebody that that you have similar values, you know, similar, you know, maybe personalities, but but you want this kind of same property. So it wouldn't have done me any good if I would have got a mentor that all they own was huge commercial buildings or these huge 500 unit apartment complexes, because that's not the kind of properties I was getting into. And so that wouldn't have done me any good. And so you have to make sure that you're getting the right mentor for what you are looking at doing. And then make sure your values align, because this is somebody that, you know, you want to you want to grow with. You know, I consider Joel a great friend now. And so we've kind of grown together. We helped each other out along the way. So you want to you want to make sure you link up with somebody that jobs with what who you want to be and what you want to be. Could you talk a little bit about, you mentioned values there. Do you talk a little bit about values? Because I know that is a thread throughout your book and how it how it's important and how you guide people through that process. Absolutely. You know, I, I'm a big proponent on, you know, I don't want to do anything in life that's going to take me away from the values that I have, right? So my parents raised me the right way. I have a certain set of values, you know, you, I want to be honest. I want to be trustworthy. I want to be, I want to care about people. I want to be empathetic. I want to have a big heart, but also this is a business too. And so it's, you know, it's, it's kind of hard sometimes to intertwine those together, but as you surround yourself with people, you want people that have similar values as you, because if you surround yourself with people that don't have the same values as you, they might be pulling you in a completely different direction that you don't want to go to. But there again, you're new to the business. And so it's like, well, hey, let me just do what they're telling me to do, even though my values might not align with it. And so you really have to be careful and surround yourself with people that with the same values because it's just so important. I didn't want to get in this business and lose myself. You know, I hear that a bunch. You know what? I, I did this or I did this business or I went and worked for this company and I lost myself. And I don't view real estate. I don't view creating a company as wanting to lose yourself. I view that as, hey, you want something that backs you up, that has the same values as you, because you you want the business you're creating or real estate that your business that you're creating to make you a better person and to amplify who you really want to be. And so if you surround yourself with people that aren't who you want to be, well, then that's going to be amplified and you're not going to be happy. Mm -hmm. Just to remind everybody, head over to SoraxConsulting.com. Take a look at how Andrew and his team can maybe help you get into this real estate investing game and take advantage of and and register for those prizes that are going on there right now. So, Andrew, we've brought or broached the subject of creative financing, and it seems like in our world, that can mean a variety of things. So could you take a moment and define what you mean by creative financing? Absolutely. You know, for me, traditional financing is, is with a bank, right? I highly recommend if you're going to go with a bank, go with a local hometown bank, don't go with a big bank because you're just a number to them. And and half the time they can't do what you're wanting them to do. Right. So for me, local hometown banks, talk to presidents, vice presidents of those banks, And so when you take it a step further than that, the creative piece is when I look at real estate, there are quite a very big percentage that owns real estate that are 50 and plus or 55 and plus. And when they're looking at selling because they've been in the business for a while, they might not want to get hit with these huge capital gains tax and pay all these taxes if if you pay them cash or if you go get it financed at a bank. And so... That's where creative financing comes into play. You can, I've even done this. You can do some seller financing where the person doesn't get killed on taxes, you know, all at one time because you're seller financing it out. You can do, I, I haven't done some of these, but I've certainly done seller financing, but rent to own, you can do a lease option where, you know, you're leasing the property on X date. You can buy the property. A rent to own, you're renting it. Some goes towards the rent, some goes to the principal. It's almost interest in principal almost. And on a certain date, you can buy it. You can also do some uh, subject two where you can assume uh, loans. There's so many creative ways now that you can get into real estate with little to no money because the more creative you are, especially going directly to the person that wants 
to sell the property. They don't want to get killed in taxes. And so they're not going to ask for a ton of money down normally. Some will, but, but the majority don't. And so you can actually get into real estate with little to no money. There's also other ways, hard money lenders, private financing, they can also get you into this world of real estate. And so there's just so many great options out there. And I feel like there just becomes more and more options, right? You know, as, as the years go on, I, I don't remember half of those options really being a thing 10 years ago, but now they are today. And, and there's, I know a lot of people that are getting into uh, real estate with little to no money because of the creative financing that you can do. I'm going to throw kind of a curveball at you. You you just finished writing this book. What is the biggest lesson you learned in writing writing this book? And what have you brought to your real estate investing from it? Absolutely. You know, writing books hard. You know, it's it takes a commitment. You know, so from the time I started to the time it was published, it took a year. And so it takes great discipline to to do what you're supposed to do on a weekly basis and to prepare. And, you know, so it, it certainly taught me that, which already kind of knew this, but, but certainly it, it re- reaffirms it, that, you know, if you commit to something, if you have discipline, if you have a plan in place and you execute your plan, uh, even if the plan doesn't go fully right, you know, sometimes you got to change that plan along the way. And I think if you do that, you can certainly be successful. And some of the great, great key takeaways from the book, it's just not a real estate book. It's certainly the new American dream, a simple roadmap to purchasing investment properties. It's about real estate, but you can make some direct correlations in there. You know, there's, there's a part in there that talks about authentic relationships. Well, that's just not about business. It's about your personal life too. There's some things in there about what's first things first, about how to create a business, but that's also can correlate into your personal relationships. You know, how, how you create this network of, of, of great relationships to, you know, how, how to do what you're supposed to do, you know, taking care of the person that's financing your dreams. That's a two-way street. You know, they're going out on a limb for you. You've got to go out on a limb for them and, and do the right thing to, to later on in the book, when's enough enough. You know, that's what I leave people with in the last chapter of the book, when's enough enough. And and for me, that was, you know, do, hey, do I continue to grow a, a rental company or, or am I OK with where I'm at? And, and how do you even come to that realization? Because you're the only one that can answer that. And you kind of have to compare yourself to your earlier year self. You know, for me, I compared to you know, about 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And would I be OK with where I'm at? You know, because I think also in life, if you continue to have goals, uh, you're almost kind of chasing a ghost. You know, so for me, let me kind of put that in perspective. When I first got in real estate, I wanted 10 units because I just wanted secondary income. I never thought I wanted to do it full time. And then I got into it. I'm like, well, I really like this. So 10 turned to 20, 20 turned to 30, 30 to 40, 50 to 100, 100 to a couple hundred. And and I was never satisfied. And so, you know, it really teaches people as well to like, hey, you also got to be satisfied in life because you're just chasing a ghost here. And kind of how I come up with that, you know, during COVID, you know, a lot of people lost their businesses, especially restaurants that were open 40, 50 years. And they spent their entire life creating this thing. And now they have nothing to show for it because they lost it. And uh, it's just kind of heartbreaking where, you know, I want people to enjoy the journey. And, and that's why Storeds is, is capitalized my consulting business. It's not about where you start. It's not about where you finish, but it's the journey in between. Because to me, that's what's most important. It's not a destination. That's mm-hmm. kind of interesting that you close out your book that way because, you know, we hear, I'm sure I'm not the first one to, to remind people that comparison is the thief of happiness, and that's kind of the trap we typically fall into. That's right. You know, and, and that's what happens to people. You know, you get on Facebook, you get on social media, and you're like, you know what, I want what they have. But what they don't realize is, that that is just a small glimpse of someone's life. I put that really into perspective. When I started doing consulting, I ran across a video of an influencer and they rented out a private jet that did not work. All it did was sit on the tarmac and people can come and go take videos. They ghosted out or, or crossed it out the windows where you couldn't see outside. And this influencer, you know, took, I don't know, 10, 15 different outfits and, and created all these different videos to post and, and it wasn't even real. 
You know, they said, hey, I fly Spirit Air. You know, I don't fly commercial, but none of my followers know that. You know, they think I fly commercial. Or, excuse me, they, they think I fly private. And so that just puts so much in perspective. You have to be so careful that don't compare yourself to other people because you're seeing such a small glimpse of someone's life on social media. You don't know if that person's really even happy or not, right? And so you have to kind of look internally and you have to be happy for yourself and do this for yourself. I don't get into real estate. I didn't get into real estate to make millions of dollars, even though I do. You know, I have a seven-figure year business, but I do it because I want to better my family. To me, what creates happiness for me is being able to see family, go on trips with family, see friends, go on trips with friends, create the time. It's the one thing you can't buy, right? It's the time. It, it allows me to do certain things that I potentially wouldn't be able to do if I was working an eight to five job. And so that's why I do what I do because I want to enjoy life. And uh, I have this saying that I don't live to work, but I work to live. It's a huge mindset difference. I do what I do because I want to live life and uh, I don't do what I do to work. Right. So I think it's a mindset thing as well. Mm -hmm. So what is uh, your core business now? Sorex Consulting, is that your primary business? The, showing people how to find this freedom or, or do you still heavily into the real estate investing game yourself? Still heavily in. I own several hundred rental units. I have a virtual property management company that I also own that manages just the units that I own. And we flip houses, loan money. But I wanted to be able to get back to, and that's why I created Sorex Consulting, because I didn't have any money to get into this business. And so I want to be able to kind of pay that forward and kind of almost do that complete 360 to where I started to be able to help people get into this business. And so I created a course with Sorex. There's one-on-ones you can get with me. There's group coaching you can get with me. And I can really help you get you to where you want to be utilizing the same strategies that I've used that, that have worked for years. And so it's really a balance between the two. I absolutely love real estate. Uh, real estate has, has blessed me far beyond I could ever imagine. And I still love getting those deals and flipping houses and having rental units. Uh, now I own money as well. And so uh, it's really... Um, I try to I try to balance the two, right? And, and I have a great team in place that really manages the rental units for me, and uh, which allows me to have a little bit more time to now get back uh, with Soros Consulting. So I'm glad you brought this up because I wanted to ch ask you about this virtual property management a little bit. Again, it's Sorex Consulting. It's going to be a clickable link in the show notes. But can you? Break that down a little bit. What do you mean by a virtual property manager? I haven't I haven't seen this yep. business model up till now. Yeah, so we used to have a brick and mortar building where I'd have property managers in that building, and, and tenants would come in and, and they would fill everything out there. You know your your leases, your applications. They pay rent there, and I think one thing that uh, COVID taught a lot of people: you don't have to have that if you don't want. You can do a lot more things virtually. You can do a lot more things remotely. And that's that's what I did. And so a little over a year ago, I took my whole management company 100% virtual. So I have two virtual assistants that work remotely from their house. And they're the ones that manage their day-to-day -day operations of the real estate management company that I own. We only manage what we own, right? You know, we, we don't manage other people's stuff, but... And so we became a lot more technologically savvy. And so what I mean by that is we got a rental management software so people can now apply online. So don't have to come in to an office to apply. You know, there's a link on the website or we send them a link. They can apply there. It pulls credit, criminal, and a background check. And, you know, we also check other things about pay stubs and re rental references. And uh, have they been evicted, you know, in the last several years? So that's now 100% done virtually. Then once you get to the point where we actually rent the property, we also sign leases virtually. You know, so you sign everything through DocuSign or, or, or a portal that we have where that's also done online. You also submit maintenance requests online as well. 
uh, which allows you to take pictures and, and send in videos of, of the maintenance issues. And so when I started thinking about this and when I started doing this, I'm like, you know what, since I can do all of this online, we also have tenants, there's a tenant portal, they pay online. So we no longer accept cash, it has to be, uh, we can draft a bank account, you can do a one-time bank draft as well, you can pay with a credit card, you can actually pay with a cash app as well. We don't need where you can actually physically come to an office. You know, we have the capability that if we need to FaceTime someone or if we need to get on a Zoom call, we can certainly do that. You know, so there's no need to actually have a brick and mortar. And so what I've done is then I created a ground team. Ground team puts lot boxes on units. They're the ones that turn the units. If we have an issue, then our, my main office contacts our maintenance team that says, hey, go to this property. And so what I found out was we are so much more productive online, being virtual than what we were in person. Because you got to think, when you start thinking about how do you become more productive? Well, anytime someone would come in and do an application, they're in, the, they're in our office for 20 minutes. And now I have a team member that is dedicating 20 minutes just to one person. Well, now our tenants are doing this on their own. And when it comes in, then we look at it. So we're saving a good hour a day because we were probably getting two or three applications a day. We're saving an hour just by making everything go virtual, just based on applications. Then when tenants would come in and pay the rent, well, you got to accept the rent, you got to run a receipt, you got to input it. Well, now they do it all virtual where it inputs it automatically, it gives them a receipt automatically. And so we're saving a couple hours every day by being virtual. And what I'm able to do then also, I don't have rent. I just rented that building out to someone else. I don't have a power bill. I don't have a water bill. I don't have the insurance that I would have to have for that for that business being in the business. And so it just creates so much more parity to do it. Now, is it hard initially? Yes. It's something new. I had to write down literally everything. So I was kind of running things more of a mom and pop style of like, you know what, I want to be involved and now I've really empowered my two virtual assistants to run this business. And so I've given them every scenario that I've run into in the last 10 years. Here's the scenario. Here's the answer on how I handle it. And so now my virtual assistants are I've empowered them to make these decisions without even asking me about the stuff. And so now they feel better about where they're at as well. We're so much more productive. They can share things with each other, even though they're not in the same that same place. Our phones is an internet-based phone system. It's the same phone number. You call it, you think it's going to a landline, but it's not. It's, it's going to an internet-based. And so they can both answer it if they need to, or they can get on a call, they can join the calls. And we're just so much more productive. It's a little bit more work up front, but you are saving so much money on the tail end of it. I wish I would have done it years earlier, to be honest with you. We're getting more money in now than we've ever got in. So what I mean by that is, you know, if you're just say 95% rented and of the 95%, you might only get 85 to 90% of the 95% that's rented. You know, you rarely ever get 100% of the money you're, you're supposed to get. We have a higher percentage of money coming in than we've ever had because of this. We have a better tenant. We're able to, we're able to vet them more. And then the great thing about the system we have, the system instead of us having a call, the system sends them a text message, an email. Every day they're laid on rent. And we are getting so better with our tenants about not being laid on rent and stuff like that because we have so many great resources in place. And so I cannot say it highly enough. I would recommend this for anybody. But And we can also help people do this. This is a part of Sorex about if you're already in real estate, we can take this step forward and, and, and really help you become virtual if that's what you want to be. Just to remind everybody one more time, sorexconsulting.com. That's going to be a clickable link in the show notes. Andrew, this has been a fantastic conversation. Yeah, before we jump into the rapid fire questions, however, is there a question or concept you wish we would have touched on here so far today? We've covered so much. I will say this. The one thing that, that I think people need to continue to understand is the authentic relationships you want to create in business. 
So the more great relationships you have in business, the more successful potentially you could be. And what I mean by that is, you know, if it's financing, don't go and just ask somebody for money. Go create an authentic relationship with them. I'm not saying go take them to dinner every single night, right? But, you know, create that relationship with them before you actually need them. Same way with local municipalities and your cities and your zoning officers, you know, reach out to them and say, hey, you know what, I'm new to the business or, hey, I wanted to create a relationship with you. Like, I know that you're new to this area and, you know, I just want to let you know who I am. Let me know if you need anything. Here's my number. Call me if you need anything. I promise when you do stuff like this, you will have a much better business. You'll, you'll operate way better because then people aren't just going behind your back or saying, oh, I got him because he did something potentially wrong. For instance, you know, municipality, if, if one of your units gets high grass in it, you know, and this one's a big one. A lot of people don't realize this, but, you know, where I live, you can't have grass more than 12 inches tall. If you do, the city will find you. And so the city's just supposed to do that. But for me, I've created such great relationships with them. They'll call me instead of sending the fine. They'll say, hey, just want to let you know, I know you don't live there. I know your tenant's not mowing the grass, but you know what? If you can get that done here in the next day or so, you know, I'm not going to issue the fine. I'm not going to issue the paperwork. I said, hey, I'll take care of it. It's things like that that make your business so much better and you're saving money in the process because you're not getting these fines. And so I would highly recommend trying to create great authentic relationships, not only with them, but also mentors with other people that have been in the business as well, because I've got great relationships with other people that own rental property and we share information all the time about, Hey, these are the trends we're seeing. And it just helps you become a better business owner helps you become a better landlord and it just helps in so many different aspects about this business and in life. No, I appreciate that sentiment. Again, we're going to send, direct everybody to soraxconsulting.com. Look for that contest. That's some pretty big uh, prizes and, and opportunity there, soraxconsulting.com. But if you're ready, Andrew, we'll jump into some of these rapid fire questions and close out this episode. Absolutely. Let's do it. So number one, what lie do real estate investors tell themselves and sometimes to others? Whew, that's a good one. It's never going to happen to me. You know, right? You know, I think I'm, I think that's with life in general, right? But I know when I first got in this business, I always told myself, well, that's not going to happen to me. I'm never going to have a house for I'm never going to have a tenant trash a unit. I'm never going to have to evict someone. I'm never going to have a maintenance person not do what they're supposed to do because I trust them. All oh, that's a lie. It's going to happen. If you're in this business long enough, it will happen to you at some point. You're going to have to file an eviction. You're going to have a tenant not do what they're supposed to do. You're going to have a house fire at some point. You're going to have, you know, a maintenance person or a, a third party vendor not do what they say they're going to do and they're going to stick you. It's just a part of the business, right? If you're in the business long enough, it's going to happen to you. So what I always tell people, trust but verify. It's okay to trust someone, but verify they are doing what they say they're going to do. And if you do that, um, you really limit those things that happen to you. Yeah, it, it eventually is going to happen. I, you know, we, we joked for a long time, you know, the whole tenants and toilets, the, you know, you're scenario until it actually happened where we had a sewer backup on one of our properties on Thanksgiving one year and try to get some help on Thanksgiving day. <laughs> Something it's, like that. it's eventually going to happen. Do you have a book recommendation or what are you reading right now? Yep. Yeah, so the book that I would recommend, certainly my own, uh, the New American Dream, A Simple Roadmap to Purchase and Investment Properties. It hit bestseller list. It's, it's done really, really well. The other one that I love going back to read is Building Wealth by Russell Whitney. It's such a great foundational book that's still relevant to this day, even though it was it was released years ago on how to certainly do this business and, and, and how you use someone else's money and you continue to, to grow a business and just great values in it. If you could go back in time and give your younger self one piece of advice, what would that be? Start earlier. <laughs> you know, don't be afraid of the unknown. 
you know, for me, from the time I left High Point University, it took me a couple of years to get up the courage to get into this business and, and to do the right things, to put myself in a position to succeed. And I think that's just a human nature thing, right? You know, when you try something new, you know, your mind tells you, oh, that's scary. Oh, don't do that because it's not in your comfort zone. Your brain wants you to stay in your comfort zone. But I promise you some of the best blessings in life comes from when you get out of your comfort zone and you do something that scares you a little bit, especially if you're doing it the right way. And so, for one, I would get in the business a lot sooner than what I did. And and number two, I wouldn't let the fears drive me from not getting in the business. You know, they tell you the best time to get into real estate was 20 years ago. The second best time is today. And so I fully agree with that. You know, don't be 10 years from now. Oh, man, I wish I would have gotten real estate 10 years ago. You know, if you surround yourself with the right people, if you do the right things, don't let your brain talk you out of it. Sure. And finally, what single strategy, process, or tool have you implemented that has had the biggest time-saving impact to your business? Absolutely. You know, for me, uh, going virtual. You know, taking my real estate company 100% virtual has just saved so much time. I can work from anywhere as long as I have internet. I have the apps on my phone, so I don't even need a computer if I don't need one. You know, I have an iPad that has the same capability. We've just become so much more profitable. Our tenants love it. You know, our tenants didn't necessarily love coming to the office to, to pay rent. So they love that they can pay rent whenever they want to pay rent, as long as it's within that time on. They can pay it at 2 a.m. if they wanted to. And we're not open. And so it's just been so great. It saves so much time. And one thing that I've learned is you don't have to do everything yourself. And so by going 100% virtual, it's made me kind of take my hands, you know, the death grip off of it and trust the team that I have in place to do what they're supposed to do. Certainly there's checks and balances and there needs to be. But I did that work up front where, hey, they know what to do if a tenant's behind on rent by a certain date. They know what to do if there's an AC unit not working. I don't need to be a part of those conversations. They already know what to do. And so what that's done, I went from working probably 50, 60 hours a week trying to run this this rental management company down to probably 25 to 30 hours a week. It has just been so awesome to be a part of. And now what I get is I only get the bad calls, right? You know, I, I never get to be a part of the great conversations because guess what they got it taken care of is it's the ones that need a little bit more work or a little bit more um, working through the situation and how to handle it potentially. You know, so I, I never get the, the good stuff. I got to meet the insurance adjuster. I got to tell the insurance company when a, when a tenant catches it on fire or something like that. So, but I highly recommend going virtual if you have that capability. It, it's just been so great. And if you don't want to go virtual, at least get a rental management software because that that just in itself creates so much freed up time for you. And one last time, soraxconsulting.com. Andrew, this has been a great conversation. Everything's going to be clickable links in the show notes, but I hope you come back again sometime and we can discuss some other things here in the future. Absolutely. Had a ton of fun today. I hope uh, a lot of people get something good out of this. I really appreciate you having me on, Jack. 